Hey, I want to let you know that our new website for our new book, Dreamwise, is now live. So head on over to dreamwisebook.com. And there's a couple things I want to tell you about over there. First of all, when you pre order the book, you can receive our guide for dream recall. So pre order the book, then head on over to dreamwisebook.com and put your name in the list to receive the free guide. And also, you can help us by submitting a dog dream. Starting next month, every month for one year, we're going to be engaging in what we've called our dreamography project, where we're going to explore different types of dreams. And to kick it off, we're starting with dog dreams. So if you've had a dream that features a dog, whether it's your dog or an archetypal dog or some other dog, tell us your dream and you'll be entered into a draw to receive a free copy of DreamWise. So that's dreamwisebook.com. We'll see you over there. Thanks. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we're going to explore a common problem that analysts try to solve. When your behaviors and attitudes that cause you great suffering feel so right, and the behaviors and attitudes that could give you relief or even happiness just feel wrong, and what can be done about that? Great. That's a great way to. To frame it, and it, you know, it, this this episode sort of grew out of something that Joseph said in a previous episode, and it really, really struck me. And I thought that is such a. It's like one of these ideas that explains, if not everything, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was, uh, I was thinking it would be interesting to talk more about it. So I think we should probably define some terms because I think we're going to be using the terms ego dystonic and ego syntonic. And these are some psychobabble terms that I don't have a good replacement for. Mm -hmm. So if I did, I'd just use those. But these, these, you know, these are kind of wonderful terms in a way because they, they give us language for this very specific, important thing. And I, like I said, I don't have a, another way of talking about them in, in great specificity without using these terms. So ego syntonic means anything that feels A-OK -okay to us. It feels like it is uh, in harmony with how we think about ourselves. And anything that is ego dystonic feels it's the opposite. It feels like this is not me. This is not right. This is not who I am. This is not something I should be embracing. So if you think about it, pretty much everything in your life, including certain attitudes, are either ego syntonic or ego dystonic. So perhaps an, uh, you know, an oversimplification, but I think that broad concepts like this can be really helpful and really help us penetrate uh, what's actually going on. And in particular, like you said, Joseph, what goes on in analysis? I think all psychotherapy has as its goal to put us in right order towards the things that are life-affirming. As Jungians, we take that a little bit deeper step, which is not just life-affirming, but actually are aligned with the deepest and most authentic aspect of oneself. Mm -hmm. And that the ego often has to change. Right. The things that are most deeply authentic to us can feel alien to the ego. So it's, it's a complicated thing that the things that are good for us and authentic can seem alien, and the things that 
keep us isolated and trapped and in suffering feel like a standard fare. Mm -hmm. Feels like an average day, and and we even kind of like some of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and this goes into, or one way of thinking about it has to do with the individual's self perception, values, and identity. So thoughts, behaviors, feelings, which are in harmony with my self perception, my values, and identity, feel natural, and and very much acceptable. I think that's a really common, um, important element, because we really find, particularly in the public discourse, this is unacceptable. This is acceptable. And then we hear that binary, God knows it's um, such a big part of the collective and all of this kind of social control that's uh, rising up in our political system. Mm -hmm. But for instance, like if a person takes pride in their work ethic, and their responsibility. They might see their perfectionism as a very positive trait mm -hmm. um, because it lines up with a central sense of themselves and their value system. Now, egodystonic stuff, again, thoughts, behaviors, and feelings, but they're in conflict with self perception, values, and identity, make people feel uncomfortable. This seems unacceptable. So, for instance, a person with obsessive compulsive disorder might recognize that their compulsive behaviors are irrational and, right. and excessive, but they still feel forced to engage in them, and it feels incredibly upsetting to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's egodystonic. This is not how I think of myself. Right, or this is not how I want to be. This mm -hmm. is, yeah, this is at odds with the way I want to with the way I want to be in the world. Um, I, you know, to frame it up, although I imagine I'll want to come back here after we've talked about it more, you were, you were talking about our specific take on this as Jungians, and it is, I think, a broadly psychoanalytic idea. But to, to flesh that out a little bit more, I think it has to do with being in right relationship with the self, let's say, or the unconscious. So this idea has underlying it the notion of the ego self axis, that our ego can be appropriately aligned with the, the values and goals that emanate from the center of the personality that Jung called the self, or we can be out of whack. And when we're out of whack, one way or the other, either because we're rejecting something we should be embracing or we're embracing something we should be rejecting, symptoms develop, we may feel stuck, we may feel depressed, we may feel anxious, we may feel a kind of inner conflict, we may have dreams that rattle us a little bit. Because in some sense, the unconscious or the self, whichever... Uh, you know, in, in, in some sense, they're roughly equivalent, is saying, excuse me, you've got the wrong attitude. So Jung talked a lot about um, finding a new attitude. And I think this is a part of that. I don't think it's quite the same thing. I think the, the, the idea of the new attitude is actually a much broader, deeper concept. But this might be part of it. Like, oh, I've always thought it was really wrong to, uh, you know, to let my anger bubble up. I always just assumed that that was wrong, that was something I shouldn't do. Uh, or, or maybe even more specifically, I always thought it was wrong to complain about my mother. And then the person comes into analysis and it's like, well, this is a space where we can talk about anything. So tell me, what would you like to say about your mother? So this thing that was very ego dystonic, which was to criticize the mother, becomes allowed, becomes uh, maybe not fully embraced, but it's no longer off limits. So we might imagine the ego is identified with being nice. Right. And then anything that doesn't seem nice seems out of character for us. And then, as you said, we then rear away or we make all these kind of rules and it doesn't seem nice to be critical about anyone but particularly perhaps one's mother who might 
we might really need to tell ourselves the truth about right. some pretty egregious behavior that was very confusing to us. And so one of the ways we'll, the weird things we'll do is in order to be nice and try to minimize the internal conflict, we'll then misconstrue some of the damaging behavior from the mom as acceptable or even laudable so that we trick ourselves into thinking, well, it must have been fine for thus and such to be done. So to get in touch with the more authentic sense, which was what you were saying, Lisa, which is this fire inside of us that's trying to protect our integrity. Mm -hmm. So being able to read those signals coming from the deep unconscious and to make adjustments in our ego attitude, oh, I need to align more with this thing that used to be off limits or, you know, this thing that I used to think was really great. Maybe it's not so great that there's a kind of flexibility in an ego that can do that, that tends to make us more adapted to the outer world, more easily adapted to the outer world, I would say, and to uh, facilitate psycho-spiritual growth. I think there's, um, we're naturally sorting into two categories, I think, which is very important, is that sometimes we might just be in therapy and, we, and somebody says, listen, I, um, I, I'm overeating. You know, I've put on 50 pounds. Um, this is unacceptable. I, I don't like it. I, I don't like to see myself this way. I, I, when, I, when I think of myself, I don't even see myself as being overweight. But then I look in the right. mirror and it's right. shocking to me. And so the therapist then examines what's going on in terms of, let's just say it's not a medical problem, but literally the kinds of food one's eating, when one is eating, the volume one is eating, et cetera, et cetera. There's something about the things one eats, volumes and time, that seem acceptable. Somehow it seems like I'm that kind of a person. You know, I've always wanted a a midnight snack of a half right. a gallon of ice cream. I, I, I started in college. I had a, you know, one or two pints of haagen -Dazs. You know, it was fantastic mm -hmm. before I went to bed. That's me. And so it's difficult for the ego on a feeling level to be able to feel that some of the things that are causing this health problem actually should feel bad because the result is, is really bad for you. But something inside of us isn't saying that at all. And then on a much deeper level, which analysis is more concerned with, is that what the self is encouraging us to take on should feel good. But initially it is so alien to us that it feels scary or unacceptable, but it won't let us go. It's that kind of road to Damascus where Paul keeps, mm -hmm. you know, he's hearing this voice, this pressure, and, you know, and he's actually going after Jesus. He's going to really got to take him down. And, and, and then all of a sudden, this intervention of self, and Paul's like, oh my gosh, I, I have, right. I, I need a 180 degree or feels a 180 degree term. It's not so much that the ego decides it, but feels that the attitude towards this thing that was negative is suddenly its opposite. Yeah. And sometimes it does happen suddenly for us. We, we, and we call those moments epiphanies and we often recognize them as important moments in our lives, but more often it's, um, it, it's a, it's a slow process. And Joseph, I know you have some really good material about uh, the kind of the change process, but I want to just set something up first before we go there, which is, um, so I'm thinking about these two different jobs that we have in analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is to invite, I think about it as an invitation. We invite people to kind of make friends with parts of themselves that they've decided for whatever reason don't have any business being there. And of course, this happens a lot in analysis. Someone comes in and, uh, you know, uh, is not very in touch with their assertiveness or they don't ever give themselves a chance to take a vacation, or they uh, kind of constantly minimize their own suffering, or they, um, uh, you know, they, they, they devalue maybe some, some really positive traits in themselves, on and on and on. 
And honestly, this is sort of, <laughs> this is kind of the fun, easy part of being an analyst, at least for me. Because when I spot that someone, for example, is um, devaluing an aspect of themselves, it, it's a real pleasure to say, well, wait a minute, you, you keep on talking as if you, you're not very accomplished and intelligent, but I know, here's some data I know that you that you, you know, you have this graduate degree and you've done this and you've accomplished that. And could you lean into that a little bit more and maybe, uh, you know, sort of let yourself know that you're actually really competent and accomplished and, the, oh, no, you know, usually there's some kind of resistance to it, but, but you're essentially um, giving them permission to reconnect with a part of themselves. And it often uh, you know, it's a real sort of good mother place. You're offering encouragement. Um, you know, even if it's, hey, get in touch with your anger, you're kind of taking the person's side against themselves a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the person who was never allowed to criticize her mother, and it's like, well, maybe, maybe that's something we actually could talk about here. It's like, really? That's not, I'm not a terrible person. It's like, no, we can talk about that. So, so uh, it tends to be um, sort of straight up easy usually um but it's the the opposite thing is equally important it happens i think more rarely but it's it's also important and it is harder at least for me when someone comes in for example i'm just going to make something up client comes in and is telling me in a very matter of fact way that um he uh he doesn't report um the income he makes from, uh, you know, sort of the side work that he does. He doesn't report any of it. And I find myself, um, you know, holding a lot of tension because I'm aware uh, of a couple different things, but l let's just kind of stick to the, the practical things around outer world adaptation that this person is flirting with uh, a disaster of getting audited and potentially, you know, in a worst case scenario, going to jail because the person is, you know, engaging in tax fraud. Um, so, and, and doesn't seem to have any concern about it, is reporting it as if it's a very normal thing. There's no fear about it. This isn't a kind of calculated risk the person has uh, made consciously. Uh, but the person has kind of split off knowing about something and has made something that should be ego dystonic into something that's, that's fine. It's not a big deal. So then I think it's our job as analysts to make this conscious, which also means making it ego dystonic. And, and uh, you know, th there's a way that when we offer someone an interpretation, we're really inviting them to take responsibility for it. So, you know, you might say something like, um, well, you know, are you concerned at all about the possible consequences of that? Just to give them a chance to become more conscious. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, well, a certain number of people who do this are likely to get audited. That, have you thought that that might happen? And just to explore it. It's not a question of passing judgment. It is a question of noticing that there is a misalignment in the attitude. I mean, I, th I think that that's just a just so. And it's part of our job to make something that was egocentric, egodystonic. I think you said that really beautifully, is that the egocentric stuff is that it just feels natural and acceptable. Right. do most of the things we do because actually most of the behaviors that we engage in day to day without even much thought feel natural and acceptable and ego doesn't have a lot of conflict about it and sometimes it takes a, another set of eyes on something to bring to light the potential or literal damage that is or could be done and what we'll first encounter, of course, is are the defenses against that anxiety. Right. And, and Freud was wonderful and accurate in how he talked about the defenses that people will rationalize it. Well, you know, the government misuses all of my money, so it's ridiculous for me to... 
or they'll minimize it and say, oh my gosh, you know, it's one out of a million persons that ever gets in that situation. Sometimes if it's really, really um, deep, people will dissociate. Uh, you'll talk about a repercussion and they'll just kind of go blank. And it, and it won't quite seem real. The room will seem somewhat two-dimensional suddenly. And it just kind of floats away as something that isn't connected to us at all. So the therapist's job is to try to introduce the reality principle is what we're talking about. Yes, So great, that the Joseph. ego yeah. can have a relationship to just these possible consequences, or in some cases, the actual consequences. You know, somebody has diabetes and they're eating sugar-laden food and they're sure it's not going to be a problem. But the doctor is saying, my goodness, you have these progressing, progressing issues. This is really serious. Minimizing, dissociating, rationalizing it away. But there are costs. Now, we might face our anxiety, say, okay, I really, truly know the costs. I've fully right. explored them. Right. I might make a conscious choice to take those risks. It, we may still feel anxious on behalf of another person, but there's also a little sense of relief that, okay, they're not deluding themselves. Right, right. And you are a sovereign being, so you get to kind of do it totally. the way you want to do it. Totally. That's a great point, and it brings up this um, what I want to say is sort of a counter-transference around these two states. When you're sitting with someone who's engaging in something that, according to the reality principle, thank you for bringing in that phrase, you know, really should be egodystonic, like eating donuts when you have diabetes or cheating on your taxes. You know, a lot of times there can be a ton of tension in the therapist or the analyst because we're aware unconsciously, at, you know, at a sort of embodied level that we're holding something that's been split off and kept out of awareness. And it does feel very different to sit with someone who says, you know, I know I'm running a risk of doing this. I've thought about it. I've done my research. It's a, it's a risk I'm willing to take. And, you know, and maybe there's some other kind of thoughts about it or, or something. But we really feel not that there's been a rationalization like, well, no, that doesn't happen to anybody anyway, or the government misuses my money anyway. But there's a real, uh, the, the, the risk and, and whatever else might be there too, because there might be ethical issues in, in, my, in the case I brought up, uh, you know, is being consciously held. Then, then there is a sense of like, uh, th there's a very different feeling, at least for me, in a case like that. It's like, yep, okay. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not being implicated in something. So if you think about the diabetic who's eating donuts and telling you I'm eating donuts. And, and want not, you to delight in it with them. Yes. Then it is like I'm being asked to collude in something. Right. I'm being asked to kind of silence my objections, my awareness of the reality part of the uh, equation. And it's a very distressing feeling, whereas if the person says, look, I, I understand this is bad for my health. I've thought about it. I know the consequences. I've talked to my doctor, and this is what I choose to do. It's like, I'm not being asked to hold anything. That person is holding both in awareness. So there, there's something here about um, the fact that sometimes when something is egocentric, when it shouldn't be, there, there is a real defensive process that's gone on and a kind of, you know, dismembering and something's really been split off. Because the unconscious holds the reality principle because your unconscious mm -hmm. mind is connected to all points in space, which means your unconscious mind knows when the thing you ate just made you sick and it takes it as a just so reality. It knows when you're doing other things that are causing you harm. It knows that. So when we are aligned with the facts, we are also aligned with that strata of the unconscious that has a lot of very fundamental instinctive information. And often in fairy tales, it's the helpful animals that often just cut to the chase. Like, oh, nope, 
you do this, right. you don't do that. You eat that horse and you run into the woods and boom, 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 um, without a lot of neurotic confusion about it because the unconscious is pretty clear about what's required to survive, if not thrive. And, and I think I, that I do a lot, want to tell you a story yeah, though, this, around this diabetic stuff, which is so interesting because I have type 2 diabetes. So um, I had a client um, who had type, what had developed uh, adult onset type 1 diabetes. And so they're needing to take uh, insulin. This is not uncommon. This happens. Um, and, and they were having some health concerns and then we were talking about it. And so I inquired about how they were managing their food. And this is something I'm looking at myself. Right. Um, and it is a struggle. Like, I get it. You know, the norms of what you have been eating mm-hmm. or what you right. thought was yummy. Suddenly, what was egocentric? We're, yeah, we're being told like that's you could lose your toes if you keep eating that, Joe. And uh, it's very hard to take that in, partly because I don't want to know that. Yeah, as an actual outcome, because people do have to have toes amputated because of a side effect of diabetes. So it's difficult to, to want to believe that's real. But in this case, persons coming in. Um, they have become morbidly obese, um, and they're on the insulin. And we're talking, and I said, well, what is, what is your favorite food that, that you like to eat a lot of? And funnily enough, um, she said, donuts. I, I love donuts. Uh, that, and I love donuts, too, like Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Who like, doesn't you know, love donuts? Exactly. I, I drive past the Krispy Kreme. I, like, inhale deeply, and, like, I'm drooling. You know, like, I... It's like, I'm done, you know, but I managed to keep driving because at least I've got some momentum to keep going past it. <laughs> um, so I'm like, totally get it. And she's talking. And when she's talking about the donuts, it's, a, it's an intensely erotic experience. And mm. the, the yeast and the glaze of the Krispy Kreme and then the jelly donuts at Dunkin' Donuts. But you have to go there in the morning because that's when they're fresh. By the afternoon, they're, they're slightly stale. And so there's a, a real process for her to, have this delicious, intense experience. When I had talked to her about it, she said that, you know, I'm at an age, I'm single, divorced. I know that I don't look conventionally attractive, and this is one of the few pleasures left mm. to me. Mm. Don't have a sexual partner, don't take pride in my wardrobe, but food is so remarkably wonderful to me. And I can see it when she talks about it. Um, it's really true. And so there's a part of me that, I mean, me it particularly, there's a part of me that's like totally gets it. I'm like, oh, like I'm in the soup with you. This is yeah. tough. Yeah. But then also, she's, she is really at risk yes. for some pretty bad stuff. Yes. So we're talking about it on and off. And then about two weeks later, she starts bringing in donuts to share with you. Oh. Yes. It's, she really it's, wants it's like, to seduce you. It's Mephistopheles, man. You know, it's like, you know, here. <laughs> and it was so intense in me. So what did you do? Because it seems like that's right where we are, right? Like, do you, do you kind of gratify her wish to share this with you? Mm-hmm. Or do you sort of interpret the fact that she's asking you to go unconscious too? It was, I, I, one, I, exactly, I felt like it was a minefield. Yeah. yeah. And I really like this person. They're so lovely, really right. marvelous. And it's so clear she wants me to, in, to enjoy this with her. And I've even told her I'm di- diabetic, so I'm like, I, I'm with you, I get the struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she comes in, and she uh, has a bag, and there's like four donuts in it. And she just comes over and she just puts a napkin down and lay, didn't even ask me, lays it down right oh next God. to my left hand. And then she <laughs> sits down and she puts a little napkin on her lap and she's got like a powder jelly donut, which I really love also, by the way. And then she's <laughs> like the look on her face. She's so delighted. It was a total war inside of me. Like you said, the, the, cornucopia in the room right this this is about sharing and something delicious and it's good and if and it is delicious my goodness 
But then there's all of the other reality that's been pushed out of the room. Sure. That I she like was to push out of the room too. Real, she was really asking you to go unconscious. Oh, and so um, what I focused on is, is um, positive feeling that she had about sharing this with me. Yeah. And she, she talked about, God, you know, I saw your, <laughs> this was true, I saw your face, Joseph, light up when we were talking about donuts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, did, I knew it would be a great experience. And I did. I was like, I, I can't, I can't, I, whatever I'm feeling is on my face. It's like totally obvious. And I was like, yes, yes, it's totally oh like my, God. but I'm imagining eating those donuts with you. It is so delightful. What did it feel like to shop for it? What was it like to give it to me? Right. I can imagine you were thinking that this would be a certain thing when you're driving over. And she's, she's like laughing with me because it's got just so much like um, infantile delight. Yeah, which I could feel in my body. Sure. And then when I said, um, "I feel so touched, so touched that you would be so generous to me," but I fear that this will injure me. Oh, that was great. That was great. And I hope that doesn't offend you. The spirit of the gift of generosity is so clear. Mm -hmm. So I'm so sorry, but. Um, but I, I won't be able to, to eat this with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. And um, she was, her eyes kind of got big. She actually welled up a little bit. Yeah. I felt terrible. Yeah. Like, oh, she feels so ashamed right now. <laughs> but no, but. But it, was, but it is exactly what you said, that, that my response perhaps was a corrective response because she didn't have an image in her mind of somebody saying, I can't do this. Right, right, right. It was in the unconscious. That didn't mean that she suddenly never ate a donut again, but we did talk about it on and off over the next couple of years. She remembered that moment of, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, I can't do this. It's harmful. So little by little, I think she took in and at least began to have a real felt moment of, Maybe the donuts don't feel quite so good as I thought they did. Right. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. That, that's such a great story. Thank you for telling that I hadn't heard that before. Oh, it was rough. It was so hard. I'm, I'm thinking about how um, when we're in this realm where something is egocentric that shouldn't be, we're often talking about denial. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, which, mm -hmm. is, which is a, you know, a psychoanalytic concept, but also one I think that's really, you know, well circulated in we all know conversation. Like. We understand what that is. So that it's often, there's often denial at work. And that, again, creates this certain tra counter-transferential feeling of like, <gasps> and I think that, you know, it's hard to do. It, it's hard to confront uh, patients. And, and less experienced uh, therapists will be likely to avoid doing that and to always be in that encouraging role. It's like, you know, I, I don't know, the, the, the lesser experienced therapist might, might have just said thank you and, and eaten the donut or, or maybe just, uh, you know, kept her mouth shut about the tax evasion or, or whatever it was. Um, you know, because it's like, oh, we think we don't want to hurt someone. We don't want to disappoint them. We don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. But that's actually why people are coming to us. You know, I, I'm thinking sometimes about uh, when I get some a new analysand, one of the things I'll always ask in, in the sort of consultation, I said, have you been in therapy before? And most people have. And I'll often say, well, what worked or maybe didn't work about the previous times? You know, what are you, what are you looking for? What, do you, what would you like to be the same? What would you like to be different? And it's not uncommon 
that people will say something like, well, my last therapist never confronted me. Mm. So, you know, people, people don't, if they're interested in a real process, they don't want to, they don't want their analyst to be a yes man. Yes, everything's fine. It's, you know, I, I think for many people who come in, because most people who come into therapy are neurotic rather than personality disordered, most of the task is going to be, you need to let yourself feel like it's okay to feel your feelings, to be aggressive, to let yourself know you're okay, whatever it is, all of those, those the first category that's relatively unproblematic most of the time. But the second the second thing, it comes up and, and we're not helpful to people if we don't deal with it. And it's very delicate because we need to have enough therapeutic rapport that we can share, the analysts can share their authentic experience or authentic response to something that's being said or something that's being described. Sometimes that can be a corrective experience because they it didn't occur to them or if it did it didn't matter so because the analyst matters at certain stages of the work their reaction to what's happening also matters sometimes well um for instance with borderline clients i've had borderline clients tell me with glee how they've really savaged someone they've really just and i and I knew, and I took him down, and then I did this, and I felt really, and I was furious, and they didn't give me what I wanted, and so I did thus and such. And, and I've had people tell really brutalizing stories, and they laugh. And it's a very delicate thing, um, but at the very least, what I'll do is go blank. Yeah, yeah. So that they're looking over and they're seeing that at the very least he's not cheering me on here in an ideal situation then they might ask mm -hmm. what's happening for me and then i can verbalize that i'm uncomfortable and concerned and other things some relational psychoanalysts will actually speak in the middle of it somebody will tell that story and they'll say ah you know, I'm, I'm feeling an enormous amount of disgust as you describe that. Yeah, yeah. And that's mm -hmm. more of an object relations kind of analysis. And that can be very surprising, of course, because most of us are too polite to say what we're feeling. But if an analyst has, really knows themselves reasonably well, and they feel that their response is reasonable and probably corrective to what the person is saying, it can have a very positive impact in the direction that you, we were just saying is this should probably not feel good to you. Right. 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 And, and, you know, the thinking is that if it is feeling good to you, I mean, there, there's a problem, right? Either maybe the person is, is really quite personality, you know, kind of access to, like mm -hmm. you said, borderline, or maybe even, you know, sociopathic, but there's some, something not normal about the lack of empathy. But, but also, I'm, I'm going back to the thinking about denial and the way that that, uh, that sort of buried psychic conflicts create symptoms. So, uh, and, and, and kind of early psychoanalytic thinking was, you need to sort of unearth the conflict, make it conscious, and then the tension will be resolved and the symptoms will go away. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about that. Um, that woman that Jung had some contact with early on who had sort of um, essentially murdered her child because she wanted to be with the, 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 um, the different man. She'd had a child and she, she gave the child some water that she knew was infected with, I think it was typhoid fever. Is that right, Joseph? Am I getting that, those details right? If I'm remembering it, that um, the local river uh, mm -hmm. was known to, to be contaminated and and yet people would use it for washing like gray water for washing yeah. and such and so she had um gotten a basin and was bathing her child and then she let the child suck on the sponge which is something that 
normally somebody wouldn't allow a child to do even right. if you were bathing right. them. Right. And then it proved to be unhealthy as as the village had suspected it was. Right. And then I think the kid died. Yeah. And and so this this kind of showed up in symptoms and you know according to Jung it's it's a little dramatic but once he was able to uh, kind of unearth this and confront her with it, and she was able to accept responsibility for it, the symptoms cleared up. And a paralyzing depression. She was so depressed mm-hmm. she had to be hospitalized. She could not function. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, one might think, well, the answer is to cheer somebody up or medicate them. Right. But for Jung, his perception was that the depression is caused by the enormous amount of effort it takes to not know something. Right, right. That, that, well, and, and was kind of a, a punishment in a way. You know, she was sort of punishing, punishing herself, but that, but that this, this thing that was, uh, well, I wouldn't say it was ego syntonic, but it was something she didn't let herself know. In the it, realm it of shadow. It needed to be, right. Well, which is, um, which is a great, place to go, right? Because, you know, as, as you point out, that which is ego dystonic, it, that's pretty much in some sense the definition of shadow. Mm-hmm. At, least, at least the conscious perception of it. Yes. Um, like to say, ooh, I am like that. Yeah. Yikes. My ego looks at that and says, I can't possibly be like that. One of my... Uh, one of my colleagues, who I'm so fond of, um, having done a lot of shadow work, will once in a while be reflecting on something difficult. And then this one time he just looked down and he shook his hair, head and he said, oh, my beloved degenerates. <laughs> <laughs> Which are these, these inner figures that want to do all kinds of things that he knows well enough he can't give in to. But he is, thinks of them as, as beloved, as kind of wild, disorganized children inside of him that he's used to give a lot of leeway to. And now it's like, I can't let the kids have the keys to the car, so to speak. Right. And, you know, Jung said at one point, the shadow is everything we don't wish to be, it's, which is, a, again, a, it's a, that's a pretty good approximation for that which is ego dystonic. But... Some things that are egodystonic should be egodystonic. Yes, they're incredibly destructive. Right. And some things that are egodystonic should be welcomed and integrated. Uh, so so it's not, it's, we're not saying that everything that's egodystonic should become egosyntonic. It's a question of discernment. Exactly. Is this something I need to welcome in? Is this something that, no, it's really not good for me to indulge, let's say, my, my, my materialistic streak and constantly order new things from Amazon so that I'm not able to pay my credit card bill at the end of the month. Right. Now, chronic, that's chronic debting probably not is dangerous. Good. Yeah. I mean, I've, we've known people with chronic debting, and, and they might have $100,000 in credit card debt, and it's just threatening, threatening all kinds of problems for them. And again, the sense of delight in the middle of it, this minimizing, oh, it's fine, I'll just get another, I'll open up the card and I'll just stick that stuff over on this card in order to continue to overvalue the pleasure of discovering something wonderful in a store and that the experience of finding and acquiring is primary, often not even using it. It's very common, let's say, with with chronic debtors to have rooms of unopened boxes because it isn't actually the owning that's interesting. No, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, right. I, d- I do want to take a pivot though, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah. That this idea of um, staying with the familiar um, mm. exists in many different dimensions. We're talking about a kind of psychological familiarity. Um, but in my first career, I was an Alexander Technique teacher. And this was kind of a self-observation discovery of this guy, F.M. Alexander. Mm. And this is, you know, in the 1800s. For his 
his issue. I'll tell the story in two seconds. But yeah, yeah, he was a professional orator, an actor. And in Australia, and so at, back in the day, in the 1800s, you kind of take a tome of Shakespeare, you'd go traveling from town to town, put up a poster, and you'd give readings in, in the civic hall of the towns, theatrical readings. And uh, you could have a career doing this. Mm -hmm. As his career was launching as a young man, he began to lose his voice, to, of course, put everything at risk consulted quote-unquote experts they said just don't talk in between gigs oh my gosh he kept losing his voice and so what he did is he set up a room of mirrors and he did this meticulous observation of himself as he was preparing to speak speaking and concluding and he was able to track a number of what he thought of as idiosyncratic physical patterns now, the difficulty was, how do we suspend those physical patterns so that we can see how the body functions without them? Which is really very, very difficult. And so the training process takes three years to be a teacher. Because, for instance, let's say that we're podcasting, and every time the podcast starts, you know, my shoulders kind of come up like this. And I can see it on the camera, but I just can't stop doing it. It's, it's so um, congruent with myself. I could force them down and create this enormous amount of tension, and now I'm fighting between pulling them up and pulling them down. But that's going to create other problems. It feels natural, normal, acceptable in terms of my physical experience of myself, because we have a kind of unconscious image of how it feels to be in our body. And when we interfere with that, it feels ego dystonic. And then we want to return to the physical uh, state that is familiar right. to us. People generally come to Alexander Technique teachers because they have often unsolvable physical pain or problems. Mm. Mm. So what we would do is kind of analyze the movement patterns, begin to determine what was interfering with normal functioning. Physical therapy might give you some exercises, but the Alexander Technique, we use the mind. It was really the first meticulous wow. mindfulness process of trying to feel the way the body sets itself up to do something with the first thought of the action. And if we can see how the body prepares to go in to do something, at that level we might be able to suspend it and then through various principles initiate the movement in a new way. My point being, when we do the movement in the new way, people find it disturbing. It doesn't yeah, feel yep. right. Even right. though they'll say, oh my God, the pain totally disappeared. Right, right. And it does not feel right. And so the ego is saying, I really want to do this. And yet the body has its own decisions to make. And so we have to keep exposing the person to the new way of moving mm -hmm. until the body itself finds it syntonic. So just as a quick exercise, you could do this me, Lisa, but Okay. If you take your hands, uh -huh. put them together and just lace them together. And palm to palm, and just look at which thumb is on top, right or left. Mm -hmm. Which is, what's it for you, right or left? Yeah, it's my left. Okay. Now I want you to look at your hands and relace them so that the opposite thumb is on top. And just feel it. And the feeling is, that kind of feels wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although there is, it's not injuring you in any way. It's not like a bad thing to lace your fingers differently, but that part of the brain that goes, uh-uh, uh, go back to the old way, doesn't have a repercussion with your hand, but if you're a professional violinist and you're doing something weird with your hand, sure, and you need to correct it, but your brain keeps saying the correction is wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, That's very... A, it's a great 
great metaphor for psychological change because, you know, what, what we're used to doing feels right. It feels comfortable. It feels weird to do something different. So for example, if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're very nice and we have trouble, be, you know, being, being a little More bit direct. assertive, yeah, right. Then being, a, you know, and this happens to lots of people. It's like, well, I, so I stood up for myself. I did this thing. I said this thing. I told the guy next to me to please put his you know, umbrella away because it was making a lot of noise, you know, during the orchestra concert. Oh, you know, that felt really terrible. It felt really wrong. Are you sure I'm not a terrible person? I mean, what if I really ruin that guy's night? You know, it's like, no, no, no. It's just, it, it feels wrong, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. It's egotistonic, but it's not wrong. And, and I think some of that, and I imagine that this is in the Alexander Technique stuff, you know, what I'll say to people in an experience like that is, you got to get used to it. It's like practice. You got to do it until it starts feeling natural. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. And there's a neurologic pathway that has to mm. open up. So it's, Alexander had stumbled upon a kind of alchemy because yes. the first step is to inhibit the unwanted thing, which is what Jung said was the containment. So interestingly enough, can I inhibit my habitual instinct to, to be nice? or to make an excuse, to say, oh, it doesn't matter. Can I watch the impulse to do that and I just say, shh, right. can I? I'm not going to attack it. Yeah. I'm just going right. to hold it back. Not even sure what else is going to happen. Just like notice it even. Just, oh, look, I had that just unquestioned impulse, that kind of knee-jerk reaction to just be nice and silence myself. Oh, look at that. There it is again, just kind of noticing it. And then, and then separating out the impulse from the need to act on it, and then, and then opens up the space where you find that you can choose to do something different. And to not engage in the action, which doesn't mean that the energy isn't still going to be there, which is what we were talking about, I think, the other day, of containment versus attacking it or pummeling it or getting really tense around it. Yeah. So because we need to feel the way the pattern is rising up in order to then analyze it and ask questions of it. Mm -hmm. If we just pummel it, then it's going to wind up going into the unconscious and it's going to come out in some other weird way. Well, that's why both Jung and Carl Rogers, they, had, they, they both said something that's very, very similar. They both said, you can't change anything unless you accept it. The, the wording is a little different, but they both mm. made that same uh, observation. And I think it's, I think it's, it's exactly what we're talking about. You know, this kind of, it's, so, so we've been doing something for a long time. It's been ego syntonic. It begins to become ego dystonic. But the response to that is, is not, if it's, if it's an impulse or an attitude, or it isn't to, uh, to, to like you said, to attack it or shut it down. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's more to kind of gently create some space for something new to come exactly. forward. Yeah. And if we want to be very structural about it, we might decide we're going to conduct very specific new experiments. So I will inhibit the impulse to say, oh, that's just fine. I just won't say anything. Mm -hmm. And then maybe with your therapist or some other way, you'll craft a couple of other responses. And sometimes, and I've done this in therapy, we'll role play, mm -hmm. which is to get a sense of what's it like in my body to right. say, oh, I'm so sorry, please don't do that. Please put your briefcase under your own chair. I have to sit over here and just practice the new behavior which won't feel right until part of it's neurologic. It just seems kind of at least possible and then maybe yes. kind of ordinary. Yes. And that's a great place because then yes. you can say it without even much stress in your voice. It's like, no. Yeah, and I, I love your example about the, uh, you know, the thumbs, because you can see how if you're used to always saying, oh, no, 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 it's no problem for you to say, you know, actually, um, could you, could you please, you know, do this other thing? It just feels wrong, but, but practicing it maybe in a, in a safe way, or even just practicing it in your imagination. Yes. I think can kind of help build that, that new pathway. And, and that's something that's well known in a lot of the sports world. Yep. That if you meticulously imagine the golf swing that would be perfect, or 
the running stride or mm-hmm. style that would really be better, the brain can set something in motion that's really mm-hmm. uncanny and interesting. So just pivoting a bit again to a pragmatic piece here, yep. that there are two researchers, a guy named uh, Prochaska and a guy named De Clemente, and they applied this in terms of addiction. Hmm. And because addictions are an extreme example of a compelling behavior that has terrible consequences Mm -hmm. for someone, and yet it never feels right to say no or to choose an alternative process. And then as they were examining the psychology of change, it was recognized that this is something that all of us do to make any kind of a change, that it's just a pattern. So there are six stages of change. I won't go into this in a lot of depth, but um, anybody who's interested can find this idea of stages of change. You can just Google it. One is that they call a a pre-contemplation stage. And so in that way, the therapist is doing a lot of active listening, expressing empathy, accepting the person's resistance to change. I don't want to give up the donuts. This is how I feel. Um, My goodness, it's the only good thing in my life. And and to actually receive the situation such as it is. Second stage they called contemplation, Mm -hmm. which is that the client or we don't quite have the confidence to take a step yet to make the change. And we can begin to recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty, there's conflicted emotions, and most importantly, which we were talking about earlier, Lisa, is there's an ambivalence about the change. And that can begin to come up, just as you were saying, by imagining or contemplating not eating the donuts anymore. Well, that makes me feel tearful, or it makes me feel angry, or... I remember this experience of someone shaming me, and and that's very, very upsetting. I don't want to give in to that. So we contemplate the change. When we move through that stage, then there's a preparation stage, which is often more exciting, that we're willing to take a step. There's some statements about the willingness to change, and we begin to set small, achievable goals. So as you were saying, Lisa, it might be, I'm just not going to say it's okay. Right. And then maybe another one would be to say, um, would you mind moving your briefcase off of, my, off of the chair there? But little tiny goals that seem achievable, that don't um, stimulate too much resistance around it. The fourth stage is a dynamic, action-oriented plan with an implementation strategy so that we know what we're going for, the actions are aligned in it in a very big way, client becomes more active, the clinician less, the fifth step is maintenance, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the science basically is that we need to adopt a change for at least six months before we neurologically and psychologically feel that this is now normal, this is the new platform, and the therapist provides advice, guidance, support, tries to help people feel hopeful about it. And then the sixth stage is relapse. (laughs) Is that it's not like you're going to suddenly forget you love donuts. (laughs) And this goes into ego strength. Yeah. That, you know, everything was was going great. And then all of a sudden, you know, my dear friend had a heart attack. And then the next thing I knew I was I was, you know, eating a box of donuts. So Knowing that the sixth stage is relapse is is an acceptance of reality. That this was an old coping mechanism, and maybe one day something bad will happen, and you'll choose something other than the donuts to retreat to. But we just get back on the bicycle, and we dust off the plan, and we do the plan again. But that's also a, a process where we're use we're going from the ego in. Because the yeah, ego can influence yes, the unconscious. Yes, yes, 
Yes. The ego's reaching yes. in and asking the unconscious to be compliant. Mm-hmm. So that's a very strategic way. Yielding to the self is almost the opposite. Yes. Which is this whole other like dream interpretations and right. trusting that someone inside of us is going to actually set the agenda. I may think the donuts are the most important thing, mm-hmm. but my dreams actually seem to suggest they never bring up donuts. Right. They keep bringing up some other things. So as analysts, we might use some ego helping strategies, but often I'm surprised. I may have spent weeks talking about what the client believes is the problem, and then the right. dreams are like, that is not even on the horizon. Right, right. You know, um, that, was, that was a great summary of the, the change process, and it calls to mind um, just the, the techniques of motivational interviewing. That's exactly where they show up. Right. And if you're, if you're familiar with that at all, which, you know, it's used often in healthcare, mm-hmm. um, but it is about making this thing that's egocentonic become egodystonic. And, and so people engaged, the practitioner engaged in motivational interviewing might use open-ended questions, affirmation, reflective listening, and summaries to begin, to begin to get the person to realize the consequences of their own actions, right? So you don't say, you know, if you keep on eating those donuts, you're going to lose your toes. You don't, you don't say that because it calls up all this resistance. But, but you kind of create a, a space for a person to kind of come to that recognition on their own. But, but you know, we, we've been in, in this, uh, like you said, Joseph, which I think is a great way to think about it from the ego in. Mm-hmm. And that, that's important, right? It like is. to be able to adapt to the outer world, you have to have a strong ego who can do that, some things like regulate your tone <laughs> intake. <laughs> But, but of course, the, the sort of um, heart of Jungian work is, is, is this relationship with the self, which I think takes us back to more of the, the first category of what yeah. have we disallowed that we need to make friends with. And just want to say you brought up dreams. I think that dream interpretation, you know, in dreams, we find both, this, both of these phenomena, but it's much more frequent that we have a dream where there's an element that's frightening that is disgusting, that uh, um, elicits contempt or, or um, you know, just some kind of aversion in one form or another. And almost always, those dreams are an invitation to embrace whatever that quality is. Not 100% of the time, but most of the time, if you have a dream about you're being chased by a frightening monster, what the psyche is looking for you is to turn, face the monster and say, Joseph, in your phrase, what are you here to teach me? So the, the psyche is always looking for integration. And there's so many parts of ourselves, you know, Jung said 90% of the shadow is pure gold, or maybe it was 99. Anyway, um, that, that these parts of ourselves that have been disallowed Though that's where, you know, the philosopher's stone is always found in the dung heap. That's where new life comes from. That's where growth comes from. So when we find ourselves, you know, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't like that about myself, or I would never want to be like that, or, oh, that person. Oh, I don't like that person, or this dream where it's someone's disgusting or frightening. It's like, wow, what, what's the invitation here? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost like one category is an invitation. The other category is usually a warning. And dreams do give us both. Yeah, because the unconscious is connected to reality. Yeah. So we're talking in the beginning, most all of us are doing shadow work, which means there are natural parts of our personality that have been repressed. It's not a choice. But they've been smushed down by the culture, which is reasonable because we kind of need to acclimate so we can fit in and survive and not be in constant conflict. And Jung also is very clear that shadow work is for the second half of life because you need a strong ego. That repression helps us. That children can't sort this stuff out with like an ironclad will. So there's a mechanism in the psyche that puts something to sleep or puts it in the vault 
because the developing ego is a baby. So somewhere around midlife, if we have, particularly we have a bit of education, we've had a job, we've had some relationships, we've muscled around with some stuff, then we can take a look at some of what we might consider an antisocial impulse, bring that to the table to talk and discover, harnessed to the right goal, Right. that's a pretty good energy, like aggression. Yes. Random, unfocused aggression is dangerous and problematic, just highly destructive. But you might need some aggression to muscle yourself up to put that application in for the new job. Right. Somebody asks you a scary question in the interview, and you're like, you know, I do have an answer. And mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of healthy aggression. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what to do in that situation. So our shadow elements, harnessed correctly, can be really great. The other set of dreams are often romantic dreams, which is the second stage of analysis where we're dealing with the anima animus, which is this process of falling in love with parts of our potential that we have never experienced and know nothing about but are fascinated by. Those dreams are fun to interpret because it's this really complicated dance of what's getting in the way of our potential shows up in the dreams what needs to happen, what's it like when a bit of the potential wakes up and we can't even relate to it, it's so unprecedented. So those are different kinds of dreams. And then once in a while, if we're lucky, we begin to have dreams of the self, or the wise old woman or the wise old man or some kind of numinous factor presents in the dream and we feel it, we're awestruck. And then we're getting put in touch with something transcendental. That offers an extraordinary promise. Mm. And all of those things at first don't feel normal yes. Yes. or acceptable yes. or natural. Yes. They're uncanny. Putting Strange. the wrong thumb, the wrong, the wrong yes. thumb on like, top. Oh, that can't be yeah. true. What what are we yep. what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And so we keep thinking about the dream and talking about it until it's like, oh, all right. It's that moment of, I can deal with that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's okay. Well, maybe this is a good place to switch to a dream. That sounds perfect. Okay, today's dreamer is a 41-year-old woman who works as a quality assurance analyst. And here's the dream. I'm in my own home with a baby daughter who arrived to me unexpectedly without a pregnancy. I am worried I won't be able to breastfeed her. She came to me from nowhere, afraid my body won't be able to provide for her. But I think practically bottle feeding will be better as I am doing this on my own and this would allow people to help me more easily. I have nothing ready for her, but I'm excited to plan our life together, so I go out and buy her what she needs. I am not daunted by this new responsibility. It feels so positive and full of love. Suddenly, I'm in an old and dated sluice room of a hospital, and the baby has turned into a boy, and he has the name of my ex-partner. I feel such vitriol and dislike for this little boy. I don't want to best... I don't want to breastfeed him or even buy him anything that he needs, so I ask people to donate their old things. I don't want him. I don't have the same worry about breastfeeding him. I hardly even want to hold him. I am so begrudging of giving him anything. I try and think of stories to tell people about his name, but I know they will see through it and realize he has the same name as my ex-partner, and this makes me feel embarrassed. I know I can give him back as I did not give birth to him, but I feel like I have to keep him. Okay, here's the context. She says, I recently separated from my partner. He had a gambling addiction that he did not want to get help for, and he ended our relationship. I was unaware of this addiction for most of our relationship. And she says, the main feelings in the dream were initially love and compassion for this beautiful baby girl. And then I felt contempt and resentment towards the baby boy. 
And finally, she says, the baby girl feels like my inner child, something that needs to be loved and cherished and nurtured. The boy feels like the resentment I feel toward my ex-partner, as though I have given enough support and it was not appreciated or felt, therefore I begrudge having to give more of myself. My house feels safe and bright and a place where we can be secure. The hospital sluice room feels cold and clinical and bare. It is private and isolated. And for those who probably haven't worked in a hospital, a sluice room is where um, contaminated objects from the surgical process go to get sterilized. Uh, When somebody takes a bedpan and they have to clean it out, they go to the sluice room. So it's where anything that's befouled or needs to be cleaned and and dissected, excuse me, (laughs) disinfected, maybe dissected too, but disinfected goes into the sluice room. That's really, that's helpful. Thank you. I wasn't sure. Wow. So being in the sluice room is, um, it's a little bit almost like a toilet dream. Like we are, we are in the, um, the shit of the personality right. and the parts of the things, at the very least, that the dreamer would like to have disinfected. We'll talk about ego dystonic and ego syntonic. Right? Absolutely. It's a perfect dream. And I, I didn't pick it that way. <laughs> but the, the, the baby girl is very ego syntonic. Mm-hmm. The dream ego is just excited and there's love and it feels safe and wonderful and, and she doesn't feel any ambivalence about it. Boy, is very just ego dystonic. This is, I feel contempt. I feel disgust. I don't want him. I don't even want to hold him. Yeah. And that what's also really interesting is she doesn't describe much about the children. That they're, mm-hmm. they're we don't know that the boy does anything or mm-hmm. what he's like or what the baby girl is like. So the dream maker is really wants us to think about the complexes that the ego relates to one image in a particular way, relates to another image in a very difficult, painful way, for her enraged way. And yet the little boy and the little girl are both contents Mm -hmm. in her psyche because Mm -hmm. everything in the dream is a part of her. So there's some aspect of her that she has um, sort of devalued Mm-hmm. And and or put off in the sluice room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it may be. Well, let's say that one of the things that makes us interested in our partners is that they are often holding some of our own potential. That's right. what makes us fall in love with them. That has to do with Jung's anima animus theory: is that we meet somebody, they hold a potential, we're fascinated by it, and the impulse to be near them is an impulse to be in relationship, and perhaps even to develop some of their qualities. And we've all seen this. Couples that have been married for 40, 50, 60 years, their personalities begin to become quite similar, that they Mm -hmm. absorb traits from each other, and the two of them seem to be increasingly congruent. Sometimes they even start dressing (laughs) alike, which Mm -hmm. you'll see sometimes Retirement yeah. homes. Let's all yeah. wear the same sweater, get the same haircut. <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah. But it goes to that um, integration mm-hmm. of the opposite. So here, there are, it's kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. No pun intended. When we've had a mm. terrible experience with a breakup that we can't initially, we can't even remember the positive qualities that we had projected onto the other person that we still need to stay in touch with. Right. Even though the person was such a bad representative of those qualities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that feels really right to me that, that somehow whatever the, her ex was, was holding or, uh, you know, like you said, what she sort of projected on him that was valuable in her, somehow she's having trouble kind of being in touch with it. She wants to reject that too, you know? So it's, Sort of like what are the like one one of the medicines suggested by the dream might be if I were working with this person I might say something like what were the good qualities about the partner what made you fall in love with him mm-hmm. and where 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 are those in yourself like they you may be so filled and it sounds like a terrible situation I mean yeah. I I feel totally you know feel lot, lots of empathy for this person but 
but you, you may be so filled with rage that you've um, that you've you've poisoned your connection with these important parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's just say that maybe the the fellow was very adventurous. So I'm going to make something right. up. Right. That's part of that, you know, riverboat gambling persona. And he's mm -hmm. adventurous or dashing, or maybe he's particularly um, urbane or witty. So if we were to extract, which I think is what she's suggesting, if we could only extract the gambling addiction and then leave the other parts, which are really fascinating and wonderful, that would have made the relationship so much better and probably would have, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's those other things. So he was adventurous, so are we going to then hate anything that reminds us of being adventurous because it, we associate it to this fellow? Or are we going to associate, you know, right. give up on all forms of wittiness if we like that quality right. because right. it reminds me of so-and-so? And of course, in the beginning that, you know, we're still sorting out, it's traumatic to suddenly mm -hmm. have a relationship disappear. Mm -hmm. And she says she's recently separated. Yes. So what we're getting is a snapshot of just the beginning process mm -hmm. of the split mm -hmm. that's in the psyche very reasonably. Yes. Totally reasonably. Yes. But, you know, what I, what I would just say to the streamer and, and to our listeners is, yes, the baby girl is precious and should be cared for and attended to. But what the dream is actually saying is, the baby boy is too. And, you know, what he represents, what he represents is also important. But the ego is having trouble coming into a right relationship with it for right now. Like you say, Joseph, I think that's important. This is just sort of a momentary snapshot. And the good news is the final sentence of every dream is always really mm -hmm. wonderful because it lets us know about where the ego has been left after the medicine of the dream has been delivered. Yeah. And the last sentence is, I know I can give him back because I didn't give birth to him, but I feel like I have to keep him. Yeah, yeah. So that's the seed of this next stage of the process, which is maybe I like being adventurous, maybe I like being witty, maybe I need a little risk-taking in the right proportion. So maybe, maybe I'll keep that. Yeah. Maybe I'll keep that baby. And I think the, the presence in the sluice room is interesting too, because it, it, it implies that the quality the baby represents has to be decontaminated. Oh, I love it that. It has to be sort of separated out from the toxic from stuff. Memories. The, yeah. The associations and the memories. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. So the image of the masculine needs to go through a little bit of a scrubbing. Yeah. So that yes. and reclaimed and reclaimed, so you don't have to dissociate from half of her potential that reminds yes. her of this guy, which would be that would be a tragedy, more tragic than the failed relationship, actually. Yes, very much. Such an interesting dream. Yeah. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.